when you realize that there are so many cells in the body, over a trillion of them, the idea that you could identify any of the cell types within your body seems very daunting. But when you realize that there's only about four different groups of cells, it makes the project quite a bit less daunting. So there's nervous tissue, muscular, skin, and then there's connective tissue, which is everything that's not nervous, muscular, and skin. When you're looking at cells, it's very hard to see most of them because they're almost transparent and colorless. So we usually add a stain to make them more visible. Here you see some of the nerve cells with a little bit of staining. They generally tend to look like kites with tails. Nerve cells are called neurons. And then you have support cells that nourish the neurons and take care of them and interconnect them. You have uh, cerebral cortex neurons, oligodendrocytes. Uh, here's tissue from the cerebellum. Astrocytes are named because they look like stars. And then you have the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. And then your glial and neuron cells. So you're going to have not so many neurons, but you're going to have a lot of support cells. Muscle comes in three types. You've got smooth, striated, and cardiac. So the smooth is the hardest of the three to, to, to look, uh, discover and figure out what it looks like because it doesn't have a lot of uh, extra markings or things. It's just a bunch of strings. But if you can think about a pot roast and the strings in the pot roast, you'll kind of get an idea because muscle is actually a series of strings kind of like that. And on this particular picture, I'm showing you what normal muscle fibers look like as opposed to someone who has muscular dystrophy. So you can clearly see that there's a difference. If you took a biopsy of someone with muscular dystrophy, their muscles wouldn't look the same. And muscles work in um, to contract, but in the case of peristalsis, like when you're swallowing, you actually have two layers, one perpendicular to the other, and as you swallow, the uh, one pushes downward and the one pushes around. So it it's kind of a, a, a rhythm that goes squeezing and then pushing down, squeezing and then pushing down. So like if you were squeezing a tube of toothpaste, it'd squirt both directions. If you're swallowing something, you don't want it to squirt both directions. You don't want it to come back up in your mouth and go down into your stomach. You just want it to go down. So you're going to have to have a downward pushing motion to keep things going in the right direction. These uh, are very easy to tell. You have two kinds of striated muscle. The one on the left is your striated muscle, which we call voluntary muscle or skeletal muscle. And you can easily see the lines. And you can see the nucleus squished over to the side. On the left, you see heart muscle, and it should look a little bit like the other one, except for you see little lines where it looks like somebody's taken some of the fibers and rubber banded them together. So you can see the striations, but you can also see these intercalated discs. And we, when we study the heart, you're going to find that the heart needs to be able to beat all at the same time and so these intercalated discs cause all the fibers to uh, interact with each other so that the whole heart beats at the same time instead of a few fibers here and a few fibers there. So the striated muscle is a little bit easier and the cardiac muscle is the easiest of all. So muscles not so hard and of course nerves kind of look like the kites so that wasn't so hard. Moving to the next type, we've got skin or epithelial cells. And there are three major kinds of columnar cells. So columnar cells, that just is a word that means column. They're tall, they're skinny. You can easily see on the left the nuclei 
and those tall skinny cells. There's a row of them at the bottom and a row of them at the top. And then there's a lumen in the middle. So a lot of times you're going to find this like lining the uh, intestines or some other uh, tube-like orifice. In the bottom right, we have intestinal cells that have goblet cells. So you have the columnar cells. And if you look carefully, you can see the columnar cells in there. On the top are little hair-like projections called cilia. And then those bulging kind of mitochondria or peanut shaped things are actually the goblet cells full of mucus. So in order to keep your fecal material moving down your intestines you need those little cilia to move it along and then you need the the mucus from the goblet cells to lubricate the lining of your intestines so things slide smoothly along. At the top right we have transitional and when you look at that there's no way that you can figure out that that's actually columnar cells. To me it kind of looks like peacock feathers so whenever I see that I go aha I know what that is. So anywhere in your body that you need tissue to really be able to stretch considerably you're going to have to put transitional epithelial there. and. What happens is when the tissue is shrunk down, you get this weird peacock or, or blebbing effect. It, but once you stretch the tissue out, then you can clearly see that it is columnar cells. So the best place to see that would be like the bladder. So when your bladder is empty, it's going to look like this picture that we have at the top right. And... It, um, of course, uh, a man's penis, you also want it to be able to stretch and then go back down. So there, there are a couple of places in your body that you would see columnar cells in their transitional state. You have squamous epithelial, and that one is the easiest for me because squamous sounds a lot like squished. These cells are going to be flat as a pancake. So at the lower left, you see actually your skin. So if you were to take a, a microscope and look at your skin, you're going to see that you have all these cells that are coming off. You have dry, dead skin coming off about the rate of a million an hour. So you're losing a lot of your squamous or your squished or your flat cells. Another place you're going to see squamous would be in the alveoli of the lungs. If you stop and think about the function of the lungs, besides having COVID, is you have to get oxygen into the body and carbon dioxide out of the body. So if you've got a very, very thin squished cell, it's very easy for the gases to diffuse across. So I've kind of drawn some arrows to show you the different uh, squamous cells. And they make bags. So if you were to look inside the lungs, it's just a series of bags. It looks like a bunch of empty grapes. Over on the top right, I have ciliated cuboidal cells. Cuboidal just means cube-shaped or square. So you're going to find cuboidal lining ducts that are squirting something out. At the bottom right, you see that they generally occur in a ring. So you can see the lumen or the hole in the middle of the ring. So that makes the uh, cuboidals pretty easy to detect. They're in a ring, they have a hole in the middle of them, they're square. So that makes it easy. Squamous are easy because they're flat. So there's no mistaking them. It, if you look at it, you can see almost like the nucleus looks like a, a fried egg. So you have a flat egg with a little bit of yolk sticking up. So that would be your squamous. Here are cheek cells. And the first one, you can't hardly see it. And the reason is because it's not been stained. So if you just go knock a few of your cheek cells out and put them on a microscope slide, it's really hard to see them. You have to use your iris diaphragm and really work to get it in focus. Once you've got it in focus, um, 
you can see uh, the ribosomes in there, you can see the nucleus, and you can kind of see the outline of the cell membrane. But if you put stain on it, so the one at the top right, you can see where it's stained, and it's much easier to find the shape of a cell. And most people just assume that all cells are round, but they clearly aren't. We've seen cuboidals, columnars, we've seen uh, some that look like kites, and um, so here are some that are kind of irregular. So these four pictures are taken with different kinds of microscopes, with different kind of lighting, and with different kind of stains. But that's what your cheek cells look like. Here is squamous epithelium. Here is hair, which is at the bottom uh, right. You can see the squamous cells, the flat cells, making like a tree trunk. That's actually your hairs. And then you see there's a hole there, and that's your hair follicle. So sometimes you get an infection in your hair follicle or a pimple. The top right is, it looks like a tree trunk. It's so neat. And you can see the, the squamous cells. And the outer layer of your cells, the squamous cells, are dead. So you can see them starting to branch off. You can see that this person has kind of a rough cuticle on her hair or his hair. And then at the top left, there's a, a cross section of a hair, and you're looking at it. You kind of have a hollow place in the middle, and then you have all of those rings of, of uh, squamous cells that are mostly just full of keratin pushing on out. And at the bottom left, you actually have a slice through someone's scalp. So on the surface, you see the, you see the dead squamous cells. And then you can see where they've cut through. And you can see where the bottom of the hair follicle is. And that's where the hair originates from down inside the, the tissue. And it grows up and pushes out and comes on out and erupts through the skin. So it's kind of interesting to see different microscopes, different viewpoints of the hairs. Now you have the outer layer of the dead epidermis and then you have what they've kind of stained a golden color. That's your dermis. So epidermis means on top of the dermis, and dermis is the skin layer. And then under it, if you look, there's some fatty cells. They look empty, they're white, and that would be your adipose tissue or your hypodermis. And you can remember that because you get a hypodermic injection. They stick it below your skin and inject in the hypo region, below the dermis. This is a kind of a neat picture. It's someone who's been uh, uh, freshly uh, deceased. And you can actually see where they cut through the layers. So you can see underneath there's the muscle. And then on the top, that's what your epidermis would look like, followed by your dermis, the hypodermis, the fascia, which is a, it's kind of like a, a white layer of connective tissue that wraps around and holds the muscle together. So you have individual layers of your skin. So it's kind of neat. And when you look at a slide, especially the ones you're going to look at in lab, you're going to probably see more than one cell type because it's rare to just cut a piece out and it just be one cell type. I say beauty is only skin deep. Here's someone who's shedding their skin. Here's another picture. Now this person has a lot more fat in their hypodermis than that other picture that we saw. Again, you see the, the dead squamous epithelial cells that are coming off the top. So this is what I'm talking about. Looking at a cross-section of tissue, you can see many different kinds of tissue within that. But whenever you see empty-looking cells, you're looking at fat. You're looking at adipose. It's one of the easiest things to identify because there's nothing in there except for the fat 
that you can see. Even the nucleus is squished over to the side. Here's another cross section of skin. And I like the way that they've colorized it so you can easily see the various layers. And if you look at those little swirls, there should be like three swirls on your screen. That's your fingerprint. That's where you're pushing up there and making your fingerprint. And that's different for everybody, even identical twins. And you can see some, um, well, the, the squamous, of course, are the outer ones. In this particular picture, I'm not seeing much in the way of the adipose tissue, although it is there. So this person must not have had a very thick hypodermis. This must be an older person where their fat has dissolved away from their skin, leaving it wrinkled because you don't have the fat layers up under it to give it its definition. So any tissue that's not nerve, it's not epithelium and it's not muscle, belongs to the connective tissue group. So this is going to be blood and bones and fat. So we've talked about fat cells. They look empty. So those yellow ones on the left side of your screen are adipose or fat cells. We haven't gotten to bone yet, but bone also belongs to the connective tissue. And it looks like tree rings made out of calcium and, and a phosphate. So that's kind of neat. One of the slides that you are supposed to be able to identify, and it's really an important one, is the areolar connective tissue, which contains mast cells. Now, unfortunately, they named areolar tissue, and most people, immediately that you say areolar, they think of the colored ring around your breast. And that is the areolar region, but that is not areolar connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue underlies all of your epithelium, all of the skin, whether we're talking about in your nose, on the outside of your body, inside your intestines, you're going to have this areolar connective tissue, and it's full of mast cells. I particularly like the picture on the left side because you can see two mast cells that aren't doing anything and then you see two of them and they're literally spewing out histamine. So mast cells are just primed and ready and all you need to do is have a bee sting you or brush up against some poison ivy or have somebody slap you and you're going to degranulate your mast cells and you're going to release that histamine. Now you'll see some little fibers and that's what makes it connective tissue. So you've got the little collagen fibers here and there, but the giveaway are the mast cells. So this is a much higher magnification on the top left than it is on the bottom right. So the bottom right is the slide that you're going to be seeing in your in your laboratory under the microscope that's the power you're going to be seeing and the giveaway are the little fibers that are kind of going in no particular direction and then those mast cells that are sprinkled around just waiting to release histamine and of course once the histamine is released the tissue swells up so that's why your bee sting swells up that's why you get those itchy bumps when you get poison ivy some of the other tissue that you're going to be looking at and, and be responsible for in lab is dense, regular connective tissue. The bottom right shows dense, regular. So it's not going to be red like smooth muscle would be. So it's kind of easy. To me, I see strapping tape. If you've ever seen something that looks like scotch tape with strings in it, that's what this tissue looks like to me and they call it dense regular and this is where you really need strength so your tendons your ligaments anywhere you need really strong cartilage that's where you can lay down some dense regular tissue so elastic tissue this is a, a really close-up of the elastic tissue. You guys are going to be looking at it under a lower power than this is. And someone was uh, telling me the name of the tape. Once you have um, an IV or 
um, they've taken blood or whatever, they'll take that stretchy tape and they'll wrap it around. They used to put band-aids on, but now they just put some of this tape around it. And I think somebody called it go tape or something like that. But anyway, if you have ever seen that, that is exactly what elastic uh, connective tissue or elastic cartilage looks like under the microscope. So wherever you need to be able to be flexible, this is where you're going to lay down the elastic cartilage. And so if you reach up and, and wiggle your earlobe, that's clearly very flexible. If you wiggle your nose, you have elastic cartilage there too. So anywhere you need to be able to move, you're going to put in cartilage. And a lot of you guys forget the word cartilage. In my mind, I substitute the word gristle because all of us have eaten meat or something that's got gristles in it. What you're doing is you're biting into cartilage. Here's some pictures of red blood cells and we talked a little bit about crenation. So if you look at the bottom right, that's a red blood cell in a person who's dehydrated. And so their red blood cells wrinkle up. And you can actually see the support proteins inside the cell that are holding its shape. If you look in the very center, you see sickled cells. So this is one of the things you looked at in the, one of the very first labs that we did. And you can see that when a person has sickled cell, not all of them sickle. So in this particular picture, I see two of them that are irreversibly sickled, meaning they can't go back to their normal shape. But then I see about three that are beginning to sickle and if this person was to receive oxygen then those could possibly go back and look like a nice uh, spherical red blood cell like it's supposed to. And there's an electron microscope picture on the top left showing where the nucleus is missing. So they look like those breath savers that have like the little filled in center. And then at the bottom left, I wanted you guys to see that because that is a needle that they've stuck in someone and pulled out and it is covered with red blood cells. You don't see it on the needle, but it's there. So people who share needles, this is what they're poking into themselves. If somebody has already used the needle, so you can see why you would catch diseases like hepatitis uh, or AIDS from sharing needles because you are transferring all that blood on the needle to the next person who uses the needle. So that's kind of an important thing to, to keep in mind.